happy to be here and uh, very happy for the opportunity to speak in front of all of you uh, about a topic that is uh, quite personal with me. I um, definitely spend a lot of time um, looking into that topic, uh, working, already worked on several projects uh, that involved event-driven architectures, uh, especially with AWS and on the cloud. So <clears throat> today um, we'll talk uh, a little bit about uh, uh, the concepts of the event-driven architecture and um, what, what are the benefits, what is the overall structure, what, what are the main components of an event-driven architecture. And um, then after that, uh, I am going to try to demonstrate to you how you can build a, um, well, rather, I would say, interesting project. Um, it's a registration authentication process, uh, the so-called passwordless authentication and registration. And uh, we're going to try to build this together with you and uh, show you how you can benefit from all the things that um, AWS and event-driven architectures can offer in terms of simplicity. So let's let's start very quickly with the theory. Let me let me see if I can share my screen. Zoom was misbehaving a little bit earlier. Share. Okay. Can you guys see my screen? Oops. We can see presenter yep. mode. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Let me see if I can fix that very quickly. <laughs> ah, swap this place. Nice. Okay. Okay. So, uh, event driven architectures in the cloud using the serverless framework. Um, quick question, does any of you ever heard about the serverless framework and, uh, you know, the, the concepts of it and how it works? Have you ever worked with it? Sure, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Cool, cool. So, so we have, we have a bunch of people that, uh, that have heard about it, worked with it, which is, which is great. Um, <clears throat> So uh, quickly over the agenda, we'll talk about what is an event-driven architecture, what are the benefits of using the event-driven model. Um, we'll quickly compare traditional versus event-driven architecture, but just briefly, we're gonna touch it. So we're not gonna go into too much analysis. Uh, then I'll introduce you very quickly to the serverless framework, and then we'll get on with, with building the actual solution and then see how we can implement everything in practice. So well, what, what is the event-driven design? That There is a really nice um, picture uh, on the AWS uh, documentation website where they talk a lot about events, event-driven architectures. Uh, essentially, it consists of, uh, it's a model, and it consists of three main components. The first one is the event producer. The second one is the event router. And then we have the event consumer. So essentially, those, those are the three main components. And they communicate with each other through the so-called event channels which can be a RESTful API, it can be a WebSocket, it can be pretty much everything that can transmit data. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Um, <clears throat> so the event producer, uh, something, let, let's, let's go very quickly through what is actually an event. Events are um, representations of the change of state in a system uh, of hardware or software. So it doesn't matter whether it's a hardware change, it's a software, it's a change within the software, it's about alteration of state. So whenever something changes in the state of, of the system, uh, it turns into an event. Uh, it differs a little bit from the concept of an event notification because the event notifications, essentially they, they themselves don't carry state. They, they're just notification mechanisms to tell you that something has happened uh, within the system. But the, uh, the actual event, it carries the state with it. So it, it tells you, okay, uh, something happened and this is how the, the state has changed from one uh, condition to, to the other. Uh, the source of an event can be from internal or external, external inputs. It, it doesn't matter uh, for, for the system. And uh, what is important to know is that events, they're asynchronous in their nature. So when, whenever an event occurs, it will be transmitted along the along with on some of the event channels, and uh, then the, either the router will pick it up or the consumer will pick it up. But the producer is agnostic towards uh, everything else down the chain. So this this is the, the asynchronous nature of it. It doesn't wait for a response from a producer or from a from a router. 
it just generates the event, pushes it down the line, and uh, then waits for the next change of state to occur so that it can produce a new event. Uh, here below, you can see a quick example of an event bridge event, uh, AWS event bridge. This is essentially one of the um, event producers within AWS that can give you a lot of different events uh, that are happening throughout the system. Uh, for example, this event is about the change of state of an EC2 instance. And as you can see, you have the details of the event, you have the instance ID and what happened to that instance ID that it was terminated. <clears throat> So very quickly about the event producers, it can be any internal or external source. It tracks for any changes in the current state. So whenever a change happens, it can produce an event. Uh, event producers, they initiate the event stream. So this is where everything starts. They, they, the, they track for changes. Whenever they detect a change, they start the event stream. So they transmit this event along the events, uh, event channels that, that you're using uh, and the transmission channels that you're using. And this essentially kicks in the event stream. And again, they're agnostic towards event consumers and event routers as well, because they don't really care what is going to happen with that event. Their sole purpose is to produce that event. So they, they have to uh, inform everyone that a change of state has occurred and this is the change, this is the new state that, uh, that has happened. Some events can carry also the old state as well. We're, we're gonna see an example of that a little bit later. Um, what is the event router? Uh, when multiple consumers are sus subscribed to the same event, uh, we might need a bit more sophisticated system that can uh, actually uh, redirect those events to different uh, streams, you know, going to, to different event channels. Uh, we're not talking about uh, consumers, we're talking about event channels. So we, again, the router does not care who sits on the other side of the, um, of the event. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't care who's going to consume the event. But what it needs to know is where to direct this event, to which event channel, to which events, to initiate essentially a new stream. So in that particular case, the event router can actually turn into an event producer because uh, even though it doesn't track the change of state, it essentially uh, pushes those events to different event streams. So it, it's like 50% <laughs> event producer because it, it initiates a new stream. Uh, they also might contain subset of events, uh, which might need to be processed in isolation, uh, which is again in rather sophisticated systems where you have a lot of subsets and a lot of different components that need to need to be taken into consideration. Uh, here is a quick example of event routers on AWS. Uh, we have the event bridge, we have the SNS, we have the DynamoDB streams, we have Kinesis, and we also have Lambda functions that. Uh, work as routers. Uh, later in the example, we're going to see uh, DynamoDB streams and Lambdas, how they work together um, to, hmm, to create this event-driven architecture. And we're also going to involve SQS into the equation so that uh, you, know, you can see how an event channel can, can, be, can be used. Uh, in that particular case, we'll use SQS as an event channel. Uh, what are the consumers? Those are the services that act upon the event. So whenever this change of state happens, something needs to be done or nothing needs to be done. It depends on the event. If something needs to be done, those consumers will do it. If they have to ignore the event, they will ignore the event. But essentially, the consumers take act upon this event. They are agnostic towards their producers. They don't care where this event is coming from. Uh, they only care about the state. They only care about the data inside uh, the event. And then they have, of course, some logic that they need to perform based on that data. Uh, also, they can act as event producers in complicated systems, meaning that this change of state that you have just notified, maybe they have to act upon it, and then they have to continue the event stream down the line toward, to further consumers that will actually dig deeper into, into the, um, the whole orchestration of the system let's say. Uh, quickly, what are the benefits of the event-driven architectures? Uh, they allow for better decoupling between different services. And uh, this is mostly because when you look at a, at a transitional monolithic environment, you see that a lot of services are interrelated between each other and they, they have to heavily rely on each other so that um, you know, whether, whether it's uh, uptime, whether it's um, you know, available service, they have to rely on each other so that they can um, they can work with event-driven architectures. You can uh, produce events and then those consumers that act upon them, they can be completely separate entities that have their own ecosystem where they work. As long as you maintain the interface, everything will be fine. Uh, 
Um, you have more control over retry mechanisms. Um, I will talk a little bit about this later as well when we look at the SQS queues and talk about the DL queues, so the dead letter queues and how you can retry on different events and how that will not interrupt uh, the whole flow. And, and even from a user perspective, this might be something that is annoying uh, and you can actually evade this by using such type of architectures. It allows for more flexibility and extendability. As long as you maintain the proper interfaces between the different services, you can produce many events, uh, spread them in different directions. You can introduce new services that can just connect, subscribe to the events, or, or perhaps generate new events that contribute to the overall state alteration of the system. Um, there is a significant impro improvement in performance, and um, we'll talk a little bit about scalability and performance um, when we start start building the whole the whole system, um, but mostly because most services that you're going to use, especially especially in AWS, especially when talking about serverless architectures, um, then we have to look at um, the overall concept of uh, service availability. And when you have shared services, those shared services they can contribute a lot towards uh, increasing the performance and scaling much better rather than the traditional model. And yes, the easier scalability, of course, where you can scale different sort of upscale, downscale, depending on the needs. Okay, um, <clears throat> quick introduction about serverless. Serverless is a tool that I very much enjoy working with. Um, let me see quickly if I can pull out my browser so that we can and open the website. Okay, so this this is the uh, this is the website of the serverless framework. It was developed. Uh, it was developed. Uh, um, sorry, okay. we can't see. Uh, we can't see the site. You can't see. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay, that's interesting. Oh, do you see? It? Yes, yes. Right now we can see. Oh, now you can see. Okay, interesting. <laughs> Very interesting how it goes. And no again. No. Now again, no. And now? No. Yes. Oh, you can see it now. Okay. I'm going to move this to the site. <clears throat> so uh, the serverless framework was developed, uh, I don't know, I think about seven, eight years ago by by some folks that were really frustrated with the way things were uh, working in, uh, you know, in different uh, directions towards deploying, um, deploying workloads to, to the cloud. Uh, so they developed this, which is a really neat tool. Um, let me let me very quickly go to the documentation. So the the things that you need to know is that it works mostly with YAML files. So for those of you who have worked with serverless, who know about serverless, they they know. Um, you know, the main serverless YAML file, and from there you can control all your um, all your resources, all your assets, uh, pretty much everything. And um, so very quickly you can uh, you can use the so-called serverless deploy commands to to deploy your workloads. Uh, the thing about serverless is that it circles a lot around functions. And when you're creating especially lambda functions, it, it does support different providers. It does support AWS, it supports Azure, it supports Google Cloud, uh, so it supports multiple providers. So since we're focusing on AWS, this is the, let's say, default provider for serverless. We'll focus mostly on the documentation for AWS, but um, of course you can take a look at uh, how things are organized uh, for other cloud providers as well. Um, you, know, you have, again, this, the main serverless YAML file, everything is controlled from here. You have different sections through which you Perform some configurations and interacts mostly with the uh, CloudFormation API. So everything that happens goes through CloudFormation and um, essentially that's how you interact with the resources. But it's extremely fle flexible and it can give you a lot of, um, a lot of interesting um, things that um, you can perform without writing too much, uh, too much code, let's say. Um, here you can see the amount of events that it supports. We're talking about uh, both HTTP and REST API, uh, a message broker like RactiveMQ, 
Um, you can have the ALP, you can see the list. It, it's pretty, it's, um, every, everything, everything in AWS, you can, you can go through this. Uh, mm, you can use with serverless. So we'll definitely take a closer look at the code and, and how things are um, shaping up when you're using the, uh, the, the framework. Uh, so it's going to be get, getting much clearer. <clears throat> so if I understood correctly, I switched the screens, but you, I think, were, were you seeing the presenter mode while I was presenting the presentation or did you see the full presentation? It was presenter mode. It was oh, presenter it's... mode. Okay, got it. Got it. So I, I see, I see what happened. Uh, so let, let's uh, sorry, Adrian, but now we can see uh, only just a part of presentation. Okay, why is that happening with that Zoom? I don't like it. So now, now you see the website, right? Yes, but the part of website. The part of the website. Okay, that's very interesting. Let me try to reshare. <laughs> if you're using Ultra White, maybe that's the problem. Uh, using what? Sorry. Ultra wide, uh, ultra wide resolutions, twenty one ah, to nine. Yes. Yeah. Well, no, actually, it's not. It's not ultra wide. No, no, it's not ultra wide. No, oh, it's now it's right. right. Yeah, now it's okay. Okay, cool. <laughs> crazy, crazy. Maybe if you bear with me just for a few seconds, I can try to do something. Else. Uh, just a quick question while we are doing this. Uh, I remember last time I checked the serverless framework, it was paid. Uh, can you give us a little? A bit more details on the payment model for serverless. No, it, it's not paid. It's actually it's it is it, it has a free part and it has a paid part. Uh, the free part is that uh, you can do anything with it. I mean, you're completely free to use it. The paid part is you have um, a dashboard through which dashboard you can actually perform some. Um, well, I would say not very fancy stuff that you cannot do without uh, the regular. Ah. So you, you get managed service uh, yes. for, for paid service. Uh, it, it's, not, it's not exactly managed, uh, but it's more like that it's, um, you get extra stuff if you pay for it. Let's put it that way. There are predefined templates, like complete solutions that you can build, uh, that you can deploy, that you can reuse, let's, let's say as, as components. And, um, for that reason, it's paid. But uh, otherwise, the free version, you can do everything with it. It's open source, it's free, so it, it's pretty okay. How is it now? Is it is it okay? Yeah, it looks good. Yep. Good. Now, now you don't see the presentation mode, right? You see the normal presentation. Yes. Good, 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 good. Huh. Shoo. Okay, uh, so very quickly to talk about uh, a passwordless with email authentication flow. What, what that is, probably most of you are familiar with it. You know what it is. It is when you try to register, you try to log into a website and you don't have to enter a password. <clears throat> Instead, you enter just the email and they will send you a link, which you click. And then when you click on that link, you will be logged in um, in the system or registered and then logged in in the system. Uh, now this is uh, this is more or less the flow. Uh, we're not going to go exactly with all the validations because it's going to take a bit extra time to to go through it. But essentially, the user inputs their email. They check if the email exists already in the system. Um, if the email exists, instead of th throwing the error, it needs to redirect to login directly to login. Um, if you are the owner of the email. Then you have a validation code that is sent to the user through that URL. Then we check whether the code is valid. If the code is invalid, we throw an error. If the code is valid, then we can, let's say, collect some additional data from the user or directly log in the user if this is an already existing user. Uh, so we're going to skip that part, possibly for the demo. I don't think we're going to have time for it. So let's, let's take a quick look uh, about the possible let's say organization of, of, of such an architecture uh, using containers. So let's say if you're building this with Node.js with an Express.js application and you want to use containers. So you can have two separate containers. Um, 
running in Fargate in an ECS cluster, and then you have to set up a VPC, you have to set up some VPC endpoints along the way, you have to set up some interfaces, uh, which are not present on the chart, but essentially they need to be here connecting the services. Um, you need to expose your service to the public, so you have to put it in a public subnet. Uh, and then within that container, let's imagine it's an Express.js application, you have to create a bunch of uh, a bunch of modules uh, with exposed through some endpoints, where you um, essentially use some utility functions as well, so that you can interact with the database with the simple email service where you send the email. Uh, this needs to be exposed through a VPC endpoint if you're going to be uh, going internally on the system, or you can go externally through the internet so you don't need a VPC endpoint. But essentially, as you can see, there are a lot of configurations that you need to do. You need to start a second container where you're going to, for example, deploy a MongoDB instance where you're going to be um, managing all the databases. You need to connect those through an interface so that they can communicate with each other. Uh, but essentially, this is more or less like the traditional standard containerized approach. You have um, two virtual machines, two containers running virtual machines where you have to maintain all of them. You have to maintain the uptime. You have to orchestrate everything so that it works properly, whether it's tr just through Fargate or whether you're going to use Kubernetes for that. So, um, it doesn't matter, but it's essentially the same approach that you're going to use along the way. Now let's take a look at how a serverless approach to the whole thing is going to look like. So this is this is an example architecture. Uh, now we're going to alter it a little bit. There are a few things that I didn't like uh, about it, so we're going to alter it along the way. I'm going to show you uh, where where exactly the change is going to be. Um, but uh, if we look at the architecture, we have an API gateway that um, has two endpoints. Uh, now, the create the, the order part, the order component of the architecture, we're not going to build because, again, we're going to go too much over time, and it's going to be a repetition of what we're going to do. So I, I don't I don't see it, think it's going to be necessary. Um, but um, we're going to build those two endpoints here for the initiate registration process and the OTP validation process. We're going to use a table, a DynamoDB table for registration codes and for also storing the users for new users. We're going to see how DynamoDB streams work uh, as an event uh, producer or more, more of an event router, actually, in that case. DynamoDB is the producer. The streams are the router. And then we're going to have another router, which is we're going to call the event distributor, which is going to um, look into different directions where what, what it's going to do with the events. And then we're going to have a bunch of SQS, uh, two SQS queues uh, through which we're going to send. So we're going to continue, let's say, the event stream through the, this event channel. And then finally, we have the two consumer lambdas, the event consumer lambdas. So the initiate registration, the OTP validation, those are, let's say, the producers of, uh, of the events, of the event state. The DynamoDB table is the state container where we maintain that state. We have the DynamoDB stream, which is the event router that is going to send those events depending on the configuration. Then we have another router with the distributor. And then we have along the line, we have the event SQS as an event channel, transmission channel, and the send email and create user lambdas. Those are the event producers, uh, event con uh, consumers, sorry, the event consumers. Uh, so uh, yeah, let's let let me remove the the PowerPoint presentation. Um, I don't like PowerPoint anyway. And let's go very quickly with um, setting up this whole environment. So let me uh, take this to the side. And let's let's start from scratch uh, and see how we can actually build something like this with uh, with serverless. Um, now I'm going to use one of my own AWS profile uh, accounts. It's we're not going to use any paid services, so uh, it's not going to generate me any costs anyway. Um, so I'm going to use this one for deployment. Uh, just uh, just a word of uh, you know of advice when you're building this with serverless, when you're building anything with serverless, make sure that you maintain your credentials um, stored as, a, as an environment variable, you know, with the AWS config property, so within that uh, config file, and then it's going to make your life much easier with uh, when working with uh, serverless. 
So, uh, yep, I'm gonna use my profile. It's already set up uh, all the credentials. So we're not gonna go through setting up the credentials. I'm just gonna start very quickly with um, setting up a folder. Well, let's call this uh, in OTP, let's say one-time password with, or passwordless email, let's call it. Oops, passwordless email. Okay, let me very quickly, I'm going to use, by the way, Node.js for this, but it's gonna work with any language that, uh, that you want. I'll show you where things need to be configured so that it knows exactly uh, which runtime to use for the lambdas. Uh, for that particular case, I'm gonna use Node.js. So let me set up a very basic project that uh, we're going to use. Not gonna need any of that for now, just the basic things. And since I already have serverless installed, so the way to install serverless on your machine is to go npl install minus g. You can install it globally so that you don't have to install it per package. If you want to maintain a specific package version, then there is also a trick for that. You can uh, install it locally as well, use it uh, I mean, locally to the project. You can use it there as well. But for me, it's much more convenient to use one, one version and always try for the newest version because um, otherwise things get forgotten and, and a little bit outdated. But if your project requires to maintain a specific version, you can always install it locally to the project. In my case, I, I installed it globally. So um, <clears throat> I type SLS version, you can see that I'm using the 3.18.2. Um, let's start with a very, very quick organization of the folder of the structure folder. So the first thing that we're going to do when starting a serverless project is to create the serverless YAML file. So this is going to be our entry point. Through the serverless YAML file, we're going to define all the configurations, the target, where we want to deploy names, variables, things like that. Um, then I'm going to need a folder for, um, for the lambdas, sorry. I'm going to need to create a folder where we're going to store our Lambda functions. Uh, then I'm going to create another folder where I'm going to store the so-called YAML files. Those YAML files, they're going to be for additional resources, additional resources that uh, uh, we're going to be creating in AWS. Things like the DynamoDB data tables, the SQS queues, uh, also the functions, by the way, we're going to define all the functions here within the YAML folder. Uh, since we're going to be using some dependencies um, as well, um, some third-party libraries uh, that we're going to need to insert to each Lambda to have, I'm going to show you how to also attach a layer through the serverless framework. framework. It's very easy. It's very convenient so that you attach that layer to each Lambda function and you can have all the third-party dependencies uh, um, available to your functions. Um, one specific, when you're creating a layer for Node.js lambdas, you need to create a folder called Node.js inside uh, the layer, the, the folder that is going to contain the layer. You also need to put a Node.js uh, folder in there and then um, go to that folder, do a quick npm in it here as well. It's going to generate me a package JSON file and I'm going to remove everything again. And I'm just going to leave the um, call this main uh, Node.js layer or Lambda layer, let's call it. Um, and this is where we're going to install dependencies and then uh, the serverless framework will pick them up and will create the layer for us automatically. Um, now, if we go back to the architecture of the solution, uh, by the way, I have um, I have this architecture here written, so maybe I can show it from here with the, with the small alterations and we can look at it while we're building it so we know what's going on. Uh, so we need to create a few Lambda. So let's let's start with uh, with the first Lambda, the initiate registration Lambda. Um, let's let's go to the Lambda folder, create a new file. Let's call this uh, init registration.js. Um, so this is going to be the first Lambda that we're going to use that it's going to communicate with, um, with a DynamoDB table. So let's, let's create the DynamoDB table. 
before defining, well, not creating, but defining the DynamoDB table, uh, I had to configure my serverless YAML file. So let's let's go through the serverless YAML file uh, line by line to see how things are um, being defined here. So the first the first clause that you define is the service. It's called service. So let's call this service uh, passwordless email. Then the next thing we have to define our provider. It's a uh, again a simple YAML file with a simple syntax, uh, two two taps indentation, uh, nothing out of the ordinary, pretty standard actually. So now we have to define the provider. We define this by typing name as a as a property, and then here we define AWS because we're going to be using AWS. Uh, then we can define our Lambda runtime. Uh, we can say, okay, we're going to use uh, Node.js 14, was it 14 point? Yes, 14 point X. Uh, this is the late, I think, uh, I think they already support uh, 16, but let, let's stick with 14 for now. Uh, then from here, we can also define the memory size for the Lambda functions. The Lambda functions, uh, we don't use to be, we don't need to be that high. So we're going to stick with 256. Uh, then we define the region. Um, usually you can define this as an environment variable so that you don't have to, you know, um, type it so you can deploy through different regions and things like that. But uh, for the purpose of the demo, I'll just hard code at the CU West one. This is, this is Ireland, the Ireland region. It's the cheapest, by the way, <laughs> of all regions. Um, then uh, we can define a stage and say, okay, uh, this, is, um, this is our dev stage since we're developing this, then we can define a stack name. This is how we're going to identify our, our serverless stack or cloud formation stack actually in AWS. Uh, now there is, the, let's go uh, passwordless email. And then here we can go and type one clause like this. It's a dollar with curly brackets where it's a notation for, for referencing um, itself essentially referencing the, um, well, not, not, it, not only itself, but it can reference uh, variables. It can reference many different things through, through that notation. In this case, I will call SLS stage. This means self provider. So this is the, pro, the provider here that I have just defined uh, and the stage. So I'm referencing this here. So whatever I define here, if I define it as an environment variable, whenever I'm deploying, for example, I can just alter in my CI CD pipeline this, this variable here stage, and this variable will then replace this here. And, and then I'll have a stack name that refers to the proper staging then where I'm deploying. It's for convenience. Then we have the something called Lambda hashing version. Uh, they this is this is a bit important because uh, you don't want to end up with many different versions of your Lambda functions. Every time you deploy, it creates a new version. We don't want that. We want to maintain only one version of the Lambda functions. Uh, so that's why I'm gonna go with this. It, it is a predefined uh, parameter 2020 12, 21. That that actually comes from AWS, not from serverless. So this this is all configuration for AWS. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so for that particular project, uh, this is going to this is going to be enough, and it's actually going to be enough for most projects that you're going to be working with. Uh, so I'm gonna just leave it like that. Um, of course, here you can define a lot of different things. You can check the reference in the documentations. You can define everything. You can define API gateways here. You can define endpoints. You can define VPCs. You can define anything that you can possibly imagine to define from an AWS standpoint. You can define it here as a configuration. Now I'm gonna quickly finish uh, the serverless YAML file because um, there are a few things that need to be done. Uh, the first thing is the packaging. Uh, I want to package the functions individually, meaning that each function I want to be packaged only, only the function itself without all the other functions. So I don't want to package the whole folder structure. I just want to package um, just the function itself. So I'm gonna say package individually through. Um, then lastly, <clears throat> I'm going to define my layer here. So to see how quickly, to how quick and easy it is to define a layer, to create a layer, what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this layer, let's say my main layer, uh, and then I'm going to give it a path. And this path is actually that folder. So it's the folder on your hard drive. So this is going to be just layer. And then I'm going to give it a name and I'm going to call it 
um, now again, let, let me show you something. It's called self uh, provider dot stack. So using that syntax, this is this is essentially the same as the SLS. I just wanted to show you the different way of doing it. Uh, it's called a self provider, and then you reference the stack name. And now this layer is going to hold this value in itself. And then I'm going to call it a Lambda layer. So now, now it's going to be passwordless email def lambda layer. So this is going to be the full name in, <clears throat> in AWS. Um, okay, so this is this is pretty much it for a basic configuration of the serverless project. Now we have um, everything defined. We have our provider. We have our runtime. We have some basic configuration here for the Lambda. We have the naming conventions. We have the region where we want to deploy, uh, how we want to package our functions, and also defining the layer. Now, as a next step, we want to define our DynamoDB table. So I'm going to quickly create a new YAML file here that I'm going to call DynamoDB.js, uh, not JS, sorry. Um, YAML. Uh, it needs to be a YAML file where I am going to um, create the CloudFormation template or the template for, uh, for the DynamoDB tape for the registration calls table. I need to define it like this with a resource. This is a pure CloudFormation notation, uh, resources. And then under resources, I'm gonna say um, registration, or let's call this OTP, OTP codes, one-time password codes table. Let's call it like this. Um, then again, pure CloudFormation type AWS DynamoDB table. And we have the properties. We have the table name. Uh, again, I'm going to use this notation self provider dot stack name, and then I'm going to call this um, OTP codes table. This is the full naming of the of the table, the table name. Then I need to define the attribute definitions. So this is the how DynamoDB uh, will essentially accept data that we're going to send it to that uh, to it. Uh, we need the first one, the attribute name. We want this to be a code or an OTP. Well, let's call it a code. And then we have to define the attribute type. And we're going to say that this is a number. Then we're going to need to define the key schema. So this is now going to be the schema for DynamoDB. Again, oops. Again, it's going to be the attribute definitions. Um, Sorry, attribute name, not definition. Uh, again, it's the same, it's code, uh, but the key type here is going to be hash because we want to um, this to be our hashing for, for the table. We're going to need that. Um, and then I have to define one last thing uh, called the provisioned throughput. So the provision throughput, uh, this is going to be our uh, configuration for the read capacity and for the write capacity. It's write capacity units, uh, which I'm going to define to one because um, so read capacity units and write. Yeah, it's going to type in uh, read capacity units. Oh, yep, you're right. Write capacity units and read write capacity units. I'm going to define it to one because we're not going to be putting too much load. Uh, but again, this is a very good example of a point where you can scale your service when you're using DynamoDB. Uh, here, if you're, if for example, your database is some sort of bottleneck, you can come here to your serverless template and you can play with the provision capacity uh, to increase or decrease uh, some of the components based, uh, based on the performance. And this is a very easy way to scale your service and to remove that bottleneck uh, being the table. Um, okay, so we have the provision throughput defined. Uh, for now, this is going to be enough. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, later on, I'm gonna add some additional things. We're gonna add the streams here as well. We're gonna see it's just two lines uh, to add the, the stream specification. So uh, we're going to come back to it later. Now I need to come here and, and say, um, I want, to define additional resources. And now I'm going to reference each file. 
And here is the neat trick. You can with sir, um, you can not you can define everything here in the in the same serverless YAML file. Everything can be in one place, but you can separate it like I'm doing right now. And then uh, what you do is again you use this notation, but you call it file, and then here you put the path to your resource file. In that case, this is my DynamoDB YAML file. Uh, so now serverless will also look at those resources and it's also going to create those resources that I define here in each and every single file that I do. Now, very quickly, let's also define the function, uh, the Lambda function. Um, I'm going to create another YAML, um, which I'm going to call functions.yaml. Within the functions.yaml file, I'm going to place um, the code, the, the template for, for our Lambda function. So DynamoDB was a pure CloudFormation template, not, nothing different than CloudFormation in a simple YAML format. The functions are a little bit different. They're more specific to the serverless framework. So um, let me show you how, um, how it's written. Um, you have to initiate registration for the Lambda. Uh, this is uh, this is purely just an uh, identifier, nothing more, just an identifier within the serverless template. Uh, now here I have to define my handler. So each Lambda function has a handler and without a handler, the function cannot function. Hmm. The function cannot function, it's not a function. Now I have to put the, put the path to, to my handler uh, on my local drive. So in my case, this is going to be the Lambda folder and it's going to be in it registration. And how am I going to call my function? Um, let's let's say handler. Let's let's stick with the basics. Um, <clears throat> then I have to give the function a name. Again, I'm going to use this notation provider dot stack name, and I'm going to call this uh, init registration. In about three minutes, we're going to deploy the whole stack, and and we're going to see how resources are being created. Uh, now I have to uh, because if you remember here in the serverless. I said that I'm I want to package each function individually. Uh, here, I'm going to define what I want to, pa to package. So um, I use this patterns uh, property in the YAML file. And within the patterns, uh, um, there are two patterns that we need to do. First, I want to exclude everything. So using this identifier, I exclude absolutely everything from the folder. So it's just an empty folder. And then I'm going to tell it, OK, now I want to deploy my Lambda in it registration.js. So this is um, how you say, I just want to deploy this single function. And you're going to see now when we're deploying, what is the size of the deployment package? It's so tiny that it's just, yeah, it's incredibly small. Um, OK, now I need to, um, I can now attach my layer. To the Lambda. And I wanted to show you how, how to attach layers to the Lambda. First, to say what we're going to need in this layer. The thing that we're going to need first in the layer is the client for the DynamoDB. So here I'm quickly uh, going to install it. Uh, I'm going to use version 3 SDK. I don't know if you guys are familiar with different versioning and how they work. Version 3 was introduced uh, not so recently, I think maybe about two years ago, one and a half years ago was introduced version three. And uh, it's pretty neat because it's modular. So I'm gonna use version three for this demo. And uh, I'm gonna very quickly install the, the client for DynamoDB. So this is um, the actual client. Oop, there we go. So now within the folder, we have the node modules folder. We're going to have the package JSON file, the package lock as well. And so uh, we have that dependency style the client DynamoDB. Now, if I want to use that library within my Lambda function, I need to attach it, either deploy the whole node modules with the Lambda or doing better using a layer. And how do you attach the layer? Now, once that we have defined it here within that, uh, within the serverless YAML file, now within the Lambda function, I can come and say, um, layer, and then here I can go like this with the curly braces and go ref main. This is how I named it here, the main. 
but you need to add also, and this is very tricky. When I was first discovering that maybe three, four years ago, uh, it, it took me weeks. <laughs> well, not weeks, but definitely days to figure out why my layer is not working. You need to add the Lambda layer at the end. This is an AWS notation, let's say, requirement, and this is how you attach the, uh, the layer to the Lambda function. Uh, we're going to need also, uh, within the function, we're going to need to access uh, the name of the DynamoDB table and so that we can interact with it. So in order to do that, I'm going to pass an environment variable to the Lambda function. Using the serverless framework, you do it by adding this property, environment. Now here, I can come and say um, OTP codes table. And then I can again reference using the short reference notation, the shorthand notation, I can directly reference it from here. So take it from the identifier, from the serverless identifier and directly just put it here and serverless will know what I'm talking about. And in when it creates the Lambda function, it's going to replace, we're going to set this environment variable to the name of the OTP code table. Um, so for now, yeah, that's what I'm going to need in here. And um, last but not least, we need how we're going to call that Lambda function. And now this is where we come to the point where we talk about events. Now, those events is what triggers those Lambda functions. So pretty much everything that you can imagine uh, that can that AWS actually allows for us to trigger Lambda functions with, so you can define it from here. Um, for this particular function, my event is going to be um, an API gateway. I want a REST API, the HTTP. And then um, I'm going to give it a path. So this is the resource path of my uh, RESTful API. Let's call this, uh, let's call this registration. Uh, and here I'm going to define the method. And since I'm going to be passing some parameters uh, to it through the body, I'm going to make it a post. All right, so this is the very basic setup for our um, demo. We have defined our Lambda function. We have defined our table. And so now let's, let's and, and we also define how we're going to call our Lambda function. Let's create a very um, simple handler. Uh, where we're just going to console log the event. And then we're going to export that handler function. Okay, so we are more or less ready with our basic setup with the first Lambda function and the first table that, uh, that we're going to need. So let's see how this uh, results in a deployment. So all you need to do once you have created the serverless YAML file, you have defined your region and you have defined your credentials. You only thing that you need to do is call SLS deploy. And I'm gonna also type verbose so that you can see what's happening. So if I didn't make a mistake on any of the templates, we should be good to deploy. And we're gonna see our first resources getting uploaded to getting created to AWS. Well, let's let's give it a moment. Okay, now we're we're creating. As you can see. Creating progress, AWS CloudFormation stack. Um, we have a bucket, serverless also creates a deployment bucket where it places uh, the templates from where it actually CloudFormation starts deploying. And if we open the CloudFormation menu here in my account, oh, there we go. And it's actually ready. Well, I don't think it's ready, but Let's give it a bit more time. You see, it's uploading my layer, the main zip file. This is my layer to the S3 bucket. There should be an update. Yes, update in progress. Uh, as you can see, by the way, we have the DynamoDB table 
OTP codes table being created. We have the Lambda with the layer version also attached. Create complete, create complete. Let's wait a little bit. Oh, there we go. So now we have created our, let's say, first deployment, the stack. We took a take a look at the resources. You can see that we have the layer, we have the table. <clears throat> Let me very quickly. <laughs> Why don't I see my function? My function should be here. But it didn't create the function. So I probably made a mistake. Ah, yes, of course I made a mistake. <laughs> I forgot. Here in the serverless YAML file, if you want to have those functions in a separate YAML file, you need to go to define those functions here. And then you tell serverless again, in which file are those functions defined. Uh, this is our YAML functions dot <clears throat> well, we can you glob files here or you should just uh, pull specify full pass here can you can you do what sorry glob like many files if you have multiple files you want you can. to add yes you can you can so this this accepts uh, this accepts an array uh so this this is the yaml notation for an array so here i can i can add um, another file or for example, um, no, no, I mean, can you globe like with uh, asterisk? Or ah, globe with an asterisk. Uh, good question. You can. Uh, for other purposes, you can. So to be honest, I, I think you should be able to do that. We can try it, by the way. I'm going to create also the SQS queues as a separate YAML file. And then we're going to uh, see if I can we can reference it here as well uh, with, the, okay. with the globe notation. Globe, yeah, sorry, I, I, I didn't catch the globe part. So we can try it with, um, here you can. So here, when I was defining the packaging, here you can. Here, here for example, I can say, I want to, I want everything that is in this folder, for example. Uh, but uh, possibly you can do it here as well. Okay, so now I define the function uh, here. And now I'm gonna deploy again. Uh, layer? What? what? Ah, okay. I guess we're going to have to update again. <clears throat> this needs to be layers in order for the layer attachment to work, but we'll redeploy again. It's actually pretty quick. How, how it deploys. Uh, what I wanted to show you here while it is deploying is that instead of, I never, I never defined anywhere an API gateway. You know, I, never, I never did that. I never defined it anywhere in any type of resource. But as, long, as soon as you put an event, a RESTful API with an HTTP function here uh, to one of the Lambda functions, it automatically creates a RESTful API. You can actually see it here an API gateway, REST API. So serverless is gonna take care of everything, configuring it, making it even like adding, for example, if you want to add additional, um, securing it with an API key or pretty much everything that you can imagine uh, to perform on a RESTful API, you can do it from, from here or from the provider. Here within the provider, you can put those definitions and serverless will take care of it without you ever creating or defining those uh, this resource, just making the configuration that you wish. Um, <clears throat> so now when I define that, I finally have a, a function. And as you can see, it automatically attached the API gateway. It created the appropriate roles. Um, look, it automatically created its own role, which is a very basic role, by the way. So 
So this is the policy. And as you can see, the only thing that it does here is it for the logs. So now you, the Lambda automatically has all the, it can write logs to CloudWatch. So this is also again, created automatically by serverless. You don't have to create, uh, you don't have to manually define it and manually create it. Uh, <clears throat> All right, so this is what I wanted to show you. Now, as you see, the layer is not attached and the layer is not attached because I made a typo here. It's not layer, it's layers. Let's quickly deploy again. Huh? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Unsupported object formats. Are you unsupported? Ah, yeah because I cannot use that notation here. I have to use the one with the two dots. That is why. Okay, now we don't have an error. <clears throat> so now we're gonna also attach the layer. Mm. While this is deploying, Let's very quickly write the code for, for that Lambda so that we can proceed the event stream so I can actually demonstrate the whole event-driven portion of, of, of our um, demonstration. So <clears throat> let me very quickly define, write the function here. Um, as I mentioned, we're gonna be using the AWS SDK client for, uh, for DynamoDB. So let me first define it, define it here. So the way it is done with version three is I have to define the client. And then I, I also, I'm going to need the put item command. And so I'm going to require AWS SDK client DynamoDB. Uh, we're also going to need one additional utility library. Now, if I quickly go to SDK version three. Now, this is a very neat reference. Well, this is the only, only reference actually for the SDK. Uh, here you can find all the modules that you can install for, for the AWS SDK version three. So we're going to need a specific module called utils, uh, util DynamoDB, this one, uh, because it's going to help us to perform those two operations, marshal and unmarshal. Uh, this is basically transforming the input for the new uh, SDK, transforming the inputs of your configuration, of your property, of your object that you're passing to Dynamo to transform, uh, transform it in the proper formats that, so that DynamoDB accepts it so that you don't have to do it manually. Otherwise, you have to define, uh, you have to define each uh, type uh, for the value, each value type, you have to define it manually within a sub property of uh, sub object property of the main object. <clears throat> so in order to do that, I'm going to actually go again to the layers, to the node, Going to do npm install, and you can see how easy it is to um, add additional uh, additional property, additional meta, additional sorry, additional libraries to the layer, so that you can use it in your uh, in your uh, functions. Now I'm going to use uh, I'm going to require my this Marshall uh, function from here. Uh, it needs to require the AWS SDK util. DynamoDB. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, I have to define the client, the DynamoDB client that I'm going to interact with. So go quickly, close the client, new DynamoDB client. It takes a bunch of parameters here, but we're just going to define the region. Uh, this is what we need. Now, uh, one note about AWS and Lambda functions, uh, something quite interesting. If you guys know how Lambda functions operate, they uh, they start within their own execution context. So it's like, uh, I, I wouldn't call it like Java virtual machines, but let's say very briefly similar to that. Uh, they create their own environment where they, um, they operate. Now, whenever a container, let's say a Lambda container gets started, uh, so this is your execution context. This is where your Lambda is going to get executed within that container. You get 512 megabytes of storage and you get uh, access to the CPU and to the memory. This 512 megabytes is like a temporary storage, it's an ephemeral storage. Uh, once the execution context shuts down, it, it disappears. Now, this execution context usually lives for around 10, 15, 20 minutes. If you don't call the Lambda again, 
it gets shut down so that it releases that spot for, for a new Lambda that needs to, to take that place. This is the shared nature of the service. So pretty much all the Lambdas all over the world use that execution context. Now, uh, when you define here clients, so for particularly for Node.js, I can, I can speak for sure that when you define that client here, you can define it either here, outside the handler or inside the handler. If you define it inside the handler, it is going to be created. So this, this, uh, this object is going to be created every time when you call that DynamoDB client class. So every time you instantiate a new class, you're going to get that object back, but you're going to instantiate it every time you call the Lambda function. However, if you define it outside of the handler, it's going to get defined on a context level. So within the execution context. So the next time you call it, it's not going to get created again because it's already created. So that's just a neat trick that actually speeds things up a little bit uh, in the overall context of the Lambda functions. So now, um, quickly back to the Lambda. Uh, I have the email because I'm going to be passing an email to my Lambda function. So I'm going to actually extract that from, um, from my body. So this is the event body. I'm going to extract it from here. Then I'm going to generate a code. So uh, there are many different ways to generate a code. I usually use one function that uh, gives me, I need a six digit code. So let's go with six digits. Um, that's gonna be a map.random, sorry. Uh, and then I'm gonna multiply that by one, two, three, four, yeah. So that's gonna generate me a random uh, six digit code every time I call it. And now I'm gonna define my input for um, my my lambda for the for the database for the, for the DynamoDB table. Now here is where we're going to use the environment variable. So if you remember here, using this environment, we define this environment variable. Now inside my function, if I want to use it, all I need to do, oops, is do process dot and then get the name that I defined here. So now I have the table name and then I'm going to create the item. So this is where I'm going to use that Marshall function uh, that I called from the util DynamoDB. And here I'm going to put the code. I'm going to put the email address. And if we have time, but I don't think we're going to have time, we can add also one other neat, neat cute little feature, but uh, we'll see if we can get there. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so this is the input. Now I'm going to go commands. Uh, and this is going to be the new put item commands where I'm going to provide the input. And then I'm just going to use the client here. This is where I'm saying that you use the client inside the handler. It's already defined, so you don't have to redefine it if you call the function multiple times. Uh, here, I'm going to pass the command. And if everything is successful, I'm going to return status code back to my uh, calling 201 that has been created. Uh, Let's also pass a body. So this message uh, created. Okay, so this is a very, very, very basic function, but it actually does the job. I mean, if you think about it, it does almost everything that we need for our passwordless registration authentication process. It takes an email as a parameter, it generates a six-digit code, and then it saves that code together with the email to a database where, of course, if you you know, you later are going to reference to it and, and see whether we're going to validate our client or not. So let's deploy this and let's try calling our API and see what happens. So I just wanted to show you one thing while it's deploying. Um, here, look at the size of the Lambda function. Because I decided to package it individually, and I removed everything except just the JSON, the, just the JS file, just the script file. And I also um, did, did not uh, put the modules, the third party modules that we we're using inside the folder, but I'm using it as a layer. My deployment size of my Lambda function is 539 bytes. And even if you have a thousand functions that you're deploying, regardless of how much time you spent on uh, deploying and you know working and or everything, it's gonna be instantly super quick because you don't have such huge sizes that you're transferring between the different uh, 
providers. <clears throat> so while it's deploying, I can actually go to my API gateway. So oh, this is the API gateway that uh, was created. Now I just want to get my URL. So let's open. I don't want a new document. I want a new request. Um, okay, let's call it demo. There's going to be a post request inside the body. I'm going to find the JSON. I'm going to say email. Um, let's go with soft surfing.com. Okay, so this is going to be my call. Uh, here I have the stage, but I also need the resource, which is what registration. Okay, so everything's deployed. Um, now, let's see what happens if I try to call this API. Oh, I get an internal server alert. Let's go to the Lambda function. And so let's see if that Lambda function triggered at all. Oh, there we go, we have a trigger. Does anybody know why it's throwing me an error? Because I actually know why. Can anyone think of a reason? Because once I open this, the reason will be quite clear. <laughs> The latest. Hmm? Latest? Wrong name. Just latest. Yeah. Mm, no. <clears throat> so uh, I have two errors actually. Modules. What modules? Okay, I, I don't know, oh, sorry, not you. I thought it's a completely different error. Modules is not defined, at init registration 29. Ah, Jesus. Ooh, got the exports, stupid typo. <laughs> okay, let's fix that here. Mm -hmm. Module.exports, this, this is why. Okay. So now that this is fixed, let's try again. We're gonna again get an error. And now, if I didn't make any other typos, get another execution. Ah, there we go. I get an access denied exception. And the reason for the access denied exception is that I did not allow my Lambda function to interact with any other resources except CloudWatch. And this is something really nice about serverless. And this is that um, it allows you to control each function uh, based on you know, what it needs to access. So the least privilege access is basically implied by the serverless uh, framework so that you never allow anything to do uh, you know, more than it's supposed to do. And this is actually quite great. So let's uh, very quickly fix that. Uh, and uh, there is uh, another concept in serverless called plugins. Now, I don't know if um, you're familiar with the plugins. They're also free, they're also not paid. There is one, plugin called I am roles per function. And it's it's pretty neat because it actually allows you to control what functions can access in terms of resources very quickly, very easily. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna install that plugin. I'm gonna show you how you can define plugins. It's it's super easy. I'm just gonna copy that. Um, I'm gonna install it here. So I'm gonna install it here in the main where the serverless YAML file is. So in my main project. Um, 
Now I get it installed as a dev dependency. And now when I, in order to use that provider, I need to come here and say plugins within the main serverless YAML file and say serverless, I, let me copy that from the website because I don't want to, it's too long. Serverless I am roles per function. So now this plugin is going to be active. And this is how you extend the serverless framework with different pl plugins. There are many different plugins out there. Uh, you can use um, pretty much all of them for free. It's very useful. Uh, and now let's go back to the function and see how we can fix that, uh, that error that we have. Um, with the I am roles per function plugin, it's essentially going a few lines. And this is I am role statements uh, name. So we first give the role, the new role that we're gonna extend our existing role with. We give it a name, uh, we're gonna call it self provider.stack name. I'm not gonna call it uh, init registration role. And then here, I'm going to define some statements. And here, if for people who have worked with policies with AWS, you're gonna immediately recognize this. This is essentially just a cloud formation policy that you apply here. You have the action, uh, which in um, our case is going to be DynamoDB put item. We want to create items there and we're gonna attach a resource. So the resource that we're going to allow this action to happen from this Lambda function. And here we're going to use the shorthand notation for a get attribute, and we're gonna go and get the attribute by here from here. So we get the reference, the uh, identifier, and we're going to paste it here and we need the arm. So for that particular operation, we need the arm. So now, thanks to this, those few lines here, I have allowed this Lambda function to only talk to, to, to perform the put item operation only on this table. You can go into a lot of granularity. You can go into a lot of details on what you give access to, what you don't give access to. But essentially, uh, the serverless framework is uh, implies the explicit deny strategy. Everything is denied and you only allow what you want to access uh, from the different resources. So now that I have this ready, so did I fix that? Yes, I fixed that. Let's deploy the stack very quickly and see if I can write the table. And then we're gonna um, look at um, <clears throat> the also the event part. So this is this is the first, let's say, serverless event driven notation where you have the API gateway triggering the Lambda function. And now this Lambda function is changing the state of the DynamoDB table. And once we manage to achieve that, I'm gonna show you how you can enable the DynamoDB streams and how you can trigger another Lambda function from those that streams, uh, from the stream. If we look at the diagram here, it's essentially this Lambda function is gonna get triggered by the stream. So let's wait for this to finish deploying. <clears throat> oh, and by the way, there, are... certainly hope that my internet did not die. No, it's working. Okay. Um, now, while I'm waiting for this to finish, uh, you see, this is what I talked about the versions. You see how the delete has been skipped. Uh, when I did that version hashing, now I don't need versions for, for each next deploy so that this actually you know, um, works pretty much better and much faster. Okay, so now we're deployed. Uh, now let's see if I managed to fix everything. Let's see if it's gonna create a code for me. Oh, there we go. So now we get a successful response, 201 created. Um, if we go to Dynamo, 
Oops. This is the table, um, explore table items. Okay, so there we go. Now we have a code and now we have the email. So, so far, so good. So this code needs to go to our, uh, this information needs to go to our uh, user through the through his email address that they gave here so that they can confirm the code and they can get their loading credentials back. Um, now, let me show you the next step. So this is, so, so essentially now we have this. So this, 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 and this. So this relationship has been created. Um, now we're gonna enable the streams and we're gonna attach a Lambda function to that stream so that it reacts to things that are happening here within that DynamoDB table. Using the framework again, we go back to, uh, to this. Enabling the stream is essentially just performing this operation. We have the stream specification. Uh, yep, stream specification. And then under stream specification, we have to tell stream view type. So the stream view type is what information we want to check. Now, if we go to the um, documentation for the streams, you have a bunch of different uh, options. You have the new item, you have a uh, key. We can take a very quick look. Then it would be stream, stream, type, stream type specification. So there it is. We have the key attributes only, the new image, the old image and the new and the old image. So this is what you can define, whether you want to receive just the new image, just the old image or any of the other things. So here you can see how you enable the stream to the console. You go and you configure everything. This is how you do it through the serverless framework. Now we're gonna tell this that we only want the new image. So this is what we're interested in. So now officially our stream is enabled. So now DynamoDB is going to uh, allow us to read that stream and to subscribe to that stream that is happening. So now let's very quickly create that distributor. So if we look at the diagram, let's quickly create that Lambda function so that uh, we can see, oops, that's event distributor.js. Um, let's go here, let's call this event distributor, give it a handler. So it's gonna be handler event distributor dot handler again. I'm gonna give it a name. Uh, call it event distributor, oops. Again, we have the package. I can actually copy, okay, almost done. Um, Again, I'm going to remove everything and I'm just going to package the Lambda and the event distributor.js. Um, I'm not going to attach the layer for now because we're, we don't have time to develop further that function. Uh, we're not going to attach the environment. I'm just going to attach the events. So this is the events. Uh, of course, we're going to need also the, uh, the roles, but let, let's first attach the event and I'm going to show you how you define the role for that uh, after that. With the serverless framework, it allows you to define here a stream. So you tell, okay, I want my Lambda function to be triggered by a stream. And then I'm going to say that this, the type of stream is DynamoDB and I need the RN of that stream. Now, how do you get the RN of the stream without you know, going into the console and also without hard coding and without referencing? Again, you use the get attribute notation. And then we're gonna, you know, we're gonna go and say the OTP codes table, RN, uh, stream RN, sorry, this needs to be stream RN. Now we get, this is how we get the stream RN because Essentially here, we enabled the stream. So DynamoDB creates a stream RN and this stream RN, we can reference it here. So now this Lambda function is gonna get triggered every time there is a new event coming from DynamoDB streams. Now <clears throat> let's, let me define the roles 
again because uh, this is going to be the event this will be clear role and then the mandatory so this is going to be an allow uh, the action is so the, the mandatory permissions is going to be get records then we need to get chart iterator I'm reading them from the documentation. I don't know them by heart. Uh, then we have the describe the stream. And then we have the list streams. Joran, I'm so sorry. We have just five minutes left. Yes, yes, correct. I, I just want to enable this. I just want to show you how the stream is going to interact with the London we're done. Uh, and There's not, uh, not an error. Uh, you haven't spaces after two dots. No, no, it's not an error. That's that's mm. how you define it. Mm -hmm. Great. That's how you define it. Um, and then again, I'm going to need here for, as a resource to get that attribute, and I'm going to need that stream R again. So this is the stream that I'm going to be allowing this Lambda to read from. So this is the configuration. This is how you configure a Lambda function that gets attached to uh, to an event stream from Dynamo. Let's deploy it. Oh. Unknown tag, get that review, what? Ah, okay. Event distributor, arm role statements name. Ah, stack. Okay, I started to push and I started making mistakes. <laughs> okay, there we go. Now let's deploy and then I'll show you how, <clears throat> how the Lambda function is gonna get triggered through the stream. Now, unfortunately, we don't have enough time. Otherwise, um, I would have showed you how you can also connect uh, SQS to the whole equation and uh, also how to activate SES, the simple email service, so that you can send those emails, you can generate a link, and then you can generate another endpoint where you, when you click that link, it's going to generate you a token, for example, if you're providing the right credentials, uh, but maybe some other time. For now, I'm just going to show you this part, this portion, and uh, how this is with a very small amount of code. If you look at the functions with a very small amount of code and a very small amount of uh, actually even the YAML templates, you activate so many different resources within AWS and you orchestrate them to work together in a serverless manner. We don't have a single server. We don't have anything that we need to manage. Everything is managed by AWS. We just manage through the uh, serverless framework, everything that we have. And the bonuses, of course, from that is when you have a CI CD pipeline that is well optimized, that works well, um, you can manage different environments. You can manage, you can replicate environments by only changing a single parameter. I only change the my credentials, for example, and the stage, and I have a different account deploying a different stage of the, the exactly same identical structure without worrying that I need to create any resource by hand. In my experience, which is over five years now with, with serverless, uh, the occasions where I had to create something manually after I create a stack with serverless, just a few, one, two, three occasions where I had to do that. Otherwise, you can manage absolutely everything through this framework and through this um, this whole package that you get from here. Uh, let's hope it's going to deploy. <laughs> uh, Sorry.
Uh, let's console log the event. Cannot be empty. You cannot actually deploy empty functions to AWS. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, well, essentially now what we're going to see is, uh, I, I just wanted to show you how this event is going to look like, you know, how this event is going to look like. And then of course you can draw a conclusion, but while we're waiting, um, since we're out of time, kind of, do you have any questions, comments, things that uh, you think are not like that or <laughs> something like that? Oops. I, I, I can't I can't hear you, sorry. I can't hear you almost I barely can hear you. Sorry, I had my mic. Uh, ah, better. <laughs> okay. So uh, I was asking about the service framework. Um because uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's multi cloud, right? So if yes. I for example want to create some Azure resources, then I just need to change the provider and that will work. Uh, yes, you need to change the provider, but you also need to, to adhere to the different concepts about the cloud formation. Yeah. So sure. here, here you're gonna keep the same methods. Also for the functions, it's almost the same as well. Uh, but for the um, here for the those additional resources, you're gonna have to adhere to the different provider specifications. Let's say. Yeah, of course. But yeah, it's multi cloud. So, here within the documentation, they have very good explanations about the different providers. Um, let me see if I can. Um, so it was the overview here. Cloud providers. Here you have Azure, Tencent, Google, Keynative, Alibaba Cloud, Cloudflare, Kubeless, OpenWhisk, Spotinst, all of those are uh, provided. And now if you look at uh, for example, here, those are the events for Azure. This is the HTTP trigger event. Again, you see it's almost identical for the function. You know, some, some small specifications here and there, but more or less uh, it's identical. Cosmos DB. So, yep, for each provider, more or less identical. Okay, um, this is deployed. So let me very quickly generate another code. And let's very quickly go to my other function. Oh, there we go. You see now this function, the event distributor has now been triggered by the event stream from DynamoDB. And now this is the event. You see the records, you have the event name, insert. You have the event source, R, and here this object within DynamoDB, it's not printing it because it's uh, I didn't do it nested, but within DynamoDB object is going to be the data. So this is going to be this, the actual data. It is, it's gonna be this. So within DynamoDB, you have an object that has this as, uh, as data inside. So this is the change in state that we've been talking about a little bit earlier. This is the change in state that uh, mm, this is the event. You saw the example in the presentation of the event bridge event. This is an example of the DynamoDB stream event that you get the new image or the old image or whatever you want to define here. Also the what happened, the insert part, and also the source. So from where it originated. And now this Lambda function can distribute that event. As I said, it can push it to an SQS queue that can trigger the Lambda that sends the email and you can have the complete circle with little code, easy to maintain, extremely easy to scale and extremely um, easy to optimize performance and it's cheap. <laughs> you know, the best, the best news about this is that um, Essentially, if even if we implement this whole thing, it's going to be free. I mean, if even well, if we have a million users, it's not going to be free. But if you have a couple of thousand of users that are registering every month, uh, it's going to be a free solution. It's not going to generate a single penny of cost. 
Okay, uh, sorry about the five minutes over. Uh, that was about it. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, and if you have any questions, any comments, I'm more than open to, to, to hear. Thank you, very interested. I hope somebody can make use of that, so. Okay, I, I think in case if uh, someone will have questions, uh, they can write you on Teams. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You can yeah. reach out me at, but you can reach out to me at any time. Yeah, that's good. So uh, Adrian, thank you so much for this presentation. You made a really good job. Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Thank